Howdy folks, welcome back to Boondockery. Today I'm off on a little wild camp and um, it's sort of more of like a, a testing camp than it is a, a true wild camp. There's a lot of things I've got coming up in the future, a couple projects that I have already initiated and I need to do some field tests and hopefully I'll be able to get everything done this weekend. I'm supposed to. This is an incredibly warm spring morning in southeastern Ohio. It's 89 degrees. And you can probably tell I'm perspiring just a small amount. And uh, that combined with a bum knee I've had for quite some time, it's going to make this uh, earlier part of the day a little bit more challenging than I would like. But that's okay, I've got plenty of water, got a nice shady area, and a little bit of a breeze right now. I'm gonna go ahead and ground my pack and tell you what's coming up step by step. Many of the things I'm going to be testing out this weekend are going to appear on this video. Other tests I'm going to be doing are going to be for other videos. Now what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be setting up two different types of camps. And the reason I'm doing that is that I am going to be doing some, a lot of wild camping this summer in my secret fun spot. And I'm going to be faced with a lot of different options. I could very easily camp in one of the numerous rock shelters that are there, which if I did that, it would be very easy. All I need is a bivy. I have no need of a tarp or anything else like that. We'll make it a very light and easy camp. However, there are all kinds of these rushing streams coming down from uh, the top of the ridge, over the rocks, waterfalls, beautiful, beautiful music to my ears. And I very easily could camp in a hammock right beside those locations. Now, if I possibly could streamline my kit to where if I go out for a three, four day wild camp, I could possibly take both with me, that would be amazing. I could camp at a different location in a different way every single time. Now, everything I'm setting up today in some way, shape, or form is going to be a first. And the ground camp I'm going to be setting up. I purchased a new Snug Pack Stratosphere, which I've never used before. This will be the first time I'm setting it up. I'm traditionally a hammock camper, but I saw that this could possibly be the thing that I could use in one of the many rock shelters there. Simply because I don't need much. I have shelter. But the one thing I think I would like to avoid are the mosquitoes, which are going to be plentiful there. And that uh, stratosphere gives me that opportunity. The other thing that I'm going to be using is a Hennessy hammock. Now, that's nothing new. I've used Hennessy hammocks numerous times. However, there could be a fluctuation in temperature being in that environment being surrounded by all the rocks, a beautiful high canopy, there's a possibility that those evenings in those rock shelters could be much cooler. Um, and around the rock shelters could be much cooler than it would be in the forest on the top of the ridge. I came up with an idea to create a under blanket for the Hennessy. <gasps> Yes, believe it or not, <laughs> the, the, the elusive goal may be achieved, but I'm going to be experimenting with that to see if that can even be possible. If it can be, 
that's going to be absolutely wonderful not only for camping in the secret fun spot but for actually seeing that as a viable well into late fall and well into early spring hammock rig the thing is i love about the hennessy is it's so compact it's a self-contained unit you have your, your tarp your hammock it's already uh, screened in it's all in one very lightweight packs very small that is very attractive to me the only thing i have to worry about then is my top quilt and my bottom quilt and both of those are quite lightweight and pack very compactly i've already got the ground cleared and ready for my ground camp just wanted to show you all the items that are in my ground camp for this environment which is going to include a tarp with i take this with me uh, to the secret fun spot i'm going to leave the tarp behind and it's a good thing because this tarp is a good, <laughs> I'd say, pound and a half, two pounds. So that would be two, two pounds. It would be away from my load when I, I start hiking up and down those uh, treacherous hillsides and cliffs. Um, a lot of rock climbing involved there, too. So any way I can light on my load is going to be better. Now, I want to start from the ground up. I'm going to be using my heavy duty space blanket I always use as a ground sheet. And the nice thing about this is I'm going to be able to have enough to protect the bottom of my stratosphere, my bivy, and also have enough to come out in front of it to where I would have someplace dry to where I could change my, my clothes, uh, take my boots off, what have you, someplace that's not going to be in the dirt and the duff. And if it's raining, it's not going to get rained on. Then. I'm going to have my stratosphere. This is it. I will do a complete and thorough review on this, especially after I have it out a few times in a secret fun spot. This thing is super compact. And from everything that I've seen and read about it, this just seems like it's going to be the bomb. This right here is going to be the next layer up. I'm going to be using my uh, Thermarest folding uh, sleep pad. And I have a an inflatable air mattress that I'm going to be using. I've only used this, I think, twice before, and it did okay, but the one thing that the bivy that I'm using this time is going to afford me is it's going to hold everything in place. Every time I've used this before, it slid one way, I slid the other, and I think this is going to work out very well with this. So I'm going to be quite comfy as far as the cush factor goes, and my old back will appreciate that. Now, from there, I have my Heli Heli Helicon, Helicon Tex Swagman Roll. This is what I'm going to use for my sleeping bag. I'm probably going to wind up using it like a hammock top quilt. I've used it like that quite a few times. It's a little cooler, but if I do need to zip it up to get more insulation, I can do that very easily. This can be a poncho liner, it could be a top quilt, it can be a sleeping bag, it can be all kinds of things. It's a great little piece of kit. And again, I'll do a review on that in the future as well. For my tarp, which will be the top layer. Well, don't want to forget my pillow. Is this the lap of luxury or what? I just, <laughs> I feel like a king. This is just going to be awesome. I'm going to be able to use all of the, this you know, cushy stuff to ground camp. And that's probably the only way I'm going to survive ground camping. <laughs> I'm not a fan. Now, uh, I also have my, my tarp. It's a 10 by 10 custom made uh, swack shack. And I also have tent stakes, my custom uh, tent stake uh, driver and puller is in there as well. And I've got all the cordage I need for my hammock. The first thing I'm going to do is put down my heavy duty space blanket as my ground sheet. Now I have used a heavy duty space blanket for over 10 years and they, in my humble opinion, are a must have item in any of your kits. If you have a ground cloth, I know a lot of people, they want to save money. They have some uh, leftover Tyvex, something like that, super lightweight, all of these other things. There's no insulation there. I've seen some people that have used like uh, to the makeshift uh, windshield reflectors uh, to keep the heat out during the summer. Look, those are okay. 
they do not roll very compact. They're lightweight, no doubt about it, and they are durable. They also make noise. That, you know, all the ones I've seen, they have a crinkle to them, and I can't help it. I've, I've still got the Army. I'm a Cav Scout. You know, noise and light discipline, that's always in the back of my mind. If it makes noise, you got to replace it with something that doesn't make noise, or you make it quiet. But the heavy duty space blankets, I started off using one and I, oh, it's been way over 10 years, probably 20 years would be closer uh, to it. But I remember purchasing a heavy duty space blanket, a military issue one from a surplus store uh, near Fort Knox, Kentucky. I think it was Gold Nugget uh, Surplus. Probably doesn't exist anymore. But it sold me on them. And since then I purchased several. Some claim to be military issue, but you can definitely tell by looking at them they weren't. Well, I was looking toward getting another one to do uh, some projects with. Well, I ran across Arcturus. i put her up here so you can see her real good and clear. Well, I don't know if that's coming in focus or not. We'll see. Now, this brand I'd never heard of prior to seeing it on Amazon. And the price was okay. And the fact that it came in Coyote Brown, I said, well, what the heck? You know, I'll give it a try. Got it. It was every bit as durable as the original real military issue um, heavy duty space blanket that I purchased, except it also came in this great zippable bag. And with this, I stake my ground sheets down and I have room in there for my ground uh, stakes as well. And slide it in, nice, neat and uh, flat. I think it's a whole lot better than rolling them up and it's self-contained this way. I don't have to use anything to, to strap it together to hold it from opening up while it's in my pack. So I used it, completely sold on it. I went back, I was gonna see without maybe getting another color. Well, however, <laughs> when I was looking at the website, I found out that they have a huge, I think it's 10 foot by 10 foot heavy duty space blanket. So now I'm thinking super shelter with that thing. So I went ahead and purchased it. I have not had a chance to play with it yet, but to make a super shelter, you need a large reflective surface. With a 10 by 10, I would have insulated floor, insulated reflective back, and par par partial overhang, which would be waterproof that I could put the clear plastic and stuff on the inside and drape it around on the sides. It's massive. So it makes um, a huge number of opportunities for me to winter camp ultra lightweight. But anyway, that's this company. I'd recommend it. And I'm gonna go ahead and put this into place. Now before I break, uh, break open the bivy and lay it out, get it in place, I just want to show you all the component parts that's in it. And unlike many things that I have purchased over the years, I have actually restrained myself from opening this until now. And there's some nice uh, adjusting buckles there, cinching buckles. And it looks like we have a decent waterproof seal on there. And it definitely has uh, got a waterproof coating on the inside there. Let's slide the contents out. Oh, the 
looky there. Are these instructions? No way. I, I, I had no idea that they did this anymore. Oh, that's outstanding. I actually had seen reviews to where they said that there were no instructions included. Bonus! Okay, we've got the stuff sack. This appears to be the actual bivy. And we have tent stakes and tent poles. These would be the tent poles. Take a look at the tent stakes real quick. Let's see what kind of quality those are. I've seen some of these types of uh, small one-person tents and bivvies come with absolutely incredible, really awesome tent stakes, and some were absolutely the cheesiest, chintziest things you've ever seen. Wow. I could kill, kill werewolves with these things. Uh, these are virtually identical to the style of tent stakes that I always use. So I'm very happy. The only thing there's no hole drilled through, no eyelet for me to be able to attach cordage for me to pull them out easily, but that's easily remedied. I have a drill. I'm going to go ahead and start setting this up. Love the color. Absolutely love the color. As you can see, it's just absolutely the perfect length to use with my space blanket. It overhangs just enough for the webbing, which is going to accommodate the stakes, to be staked out on either end. Also, you'll be able to see I have a little problem over here. Now, this is a problem. I need to stake this down, and in doing so, I will have to poke a hole through my heavy-duty space blanket. Well, she's a no good, okay? She's a no good. However, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stake down all the other five first, and then if I feel that this is not going to be able to be held in position the way it needs to be, I'll simply attach a piece of webbing here, take it all the way over to the end, off the uh, space, space blanket, uh, make it good and taut, and we'll stake it down that way. It'll just be connected with a line off of the space blanket. We're going to put the uh, poles in next, and that's going to hold the area that's screened in up off of your face. And to my understanding is that these poles, even though they look absolutely identical, apparently they are color-coded. And on the small sleeve that the poles go through to create an X over the head bug net area, there is a small tab on the end of those sleeves that correspond with one of two colors. They will either be green or black. We'll go ahead and put these in place. They are most certainly marked. This small tab is green, this one is black. So we'll go ahead and start off with the green one. We're going to run that through. These are screw tipped aluminum poles. 
and they allow them to be able to be inserted in the webbing that is also being utilized with the stakes. these ones into position and this one is the one that's going to have an issue perhaps with staking down we will see I think there's a good potential we may not even have to stake that down Very, very taut. That is really rigid. That looks great. Now the last thing we need to do is to stake out this small little fly area here. And I'm actually going to use that piece of bungee that's on there to really get that to get good and flexed. Let that absorb that energy. Excellent. Now that we've taken care of the shelter factor, now it's time to take care of the comfort factor. Go ahead and open this up. It has a two-way zip. Put it all the way down. There's Velcro closures on these. Again, I'll do a formal review on these another day, but that's a good four, four and a half inches of overlap of waterproof material over the zip. And that's fantastic. Another zip up here up and over and that reveals a nice feature which is good breathable mesh same mesh that's in the back area that's covered with a small fly and you can unzip this from the inside or the out so that way you can open it up all the way And we'll just open that up. And if you need to, you can unzip this all the way. And there's small toggles with elasticized straps. You just tuck it right up out of your way. First thing we're going to put in is my Thermarest mat. Now, I've never used one like this before. That's accordion folded. Uh, the only one, the only ISO mat I've ever used was the one that was issued to me while I was in the Army. And... Um, it was, it was okay, it was okay. And it definitely kept small rocks and twigs from my back. And the reason I want this is not so much for my back comfort, it's for protection for my Ecotec inflatable air mattress. I do have a repair kit for it, but if you don't have to repair it, that's always best. Now right off the bat, just a first observation, first impression, just by putting the mats in the toe area, I think it would have been nice to have a pulled area there, a small loop, just to lift the toe up a little bit. And my Trekology pillow, it's got a little elasticized strap there, I'm going to strap that around the mat and the pad so it doesn't go anywhere and last but certainly not least my helicon tex multi-cam swagman roll like i said you can use this exactly like a sleeping bag i'm going to use mine as a top quilt and i just zip the very bottom and about one fourth of the length up the side that's going to be my toe box. I'm just going to slide that right down inside there. Now, since it's oh, oh so oppressively warm, 
I'm not going to get underneath the swagman roll. I am going to get inside. To, well, I guess I could do this on the outside. Don't necessarily have to get inside to see how comfy it is. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Wow. So this is what comfortable ground camp is supposed to feel like. I think I could get used to it. Now that is a fine looking piece of equipment right there. Now if you recall, I had an issue with this extra loop not being able to stake that down. I have a little uh, extra piece of bungee cord that I'm just going to go ahead and feed through here, loop it around on itself. Then I'm going to take the tent stake right out here and stake that in position. And now, if by any chance it ever was an issue, the issue has been resolved. Well, here you are, a 100% bona fide jungle bivouac. All set up, ready to test out tonight. Well, folks, some of you may know about the Hennessy Hammock, but the Hennessy Hammock is famous for its bottom entry. It's simply just an opening with Velcro closure. Now, because of that opening, it has been an absolute impossibility for people to produce under quilts for these. I came up with an idea several years ago is you simply get a couple whoobies, uh, GI issue uh, poncho liners, and you sew them together and you literally sew a Velcro opening in the underquilt and the whoobie exactly like the hammock. Haven't got around to doing that. However, I started thinking about it. And if you had a decent enough under blanket area and you were to elasticize the edges and connect them to the connecting points on the four corners of the hammock, you could essentially just push the under quilt out of your way as you enter the hammock and when you come inside the hammock the elastic will pull the under quilt or the whoopee back into position that's the theory let's see how it's going to work in practice now the only two materials i need to make this happen is i have my kafaro whoopee which is this is actually a warmer version of the whoopee called the doobie don't ask me, I didn't name it. It's just what it's called, the Kafaro Doobie. Just a super warm whoopee. And I have a spool of bungee cord. Whether or not you have a whoopee, you have a doobie, or you have an arctic whoopee. All of Kafaro's whoobies, doobies, or arctic whoobies have webbing, or excuse me, I'd say these are 550 cord cordage loops sewn ever so many inches all the way around. I'm going to use those to lace my bungee cord through. Before I start lacing this stuff through, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start at one corner and I'm going to work my way around, unrolling the bungee cord as I go to get a rough idea as far as the maximum amount of, of this bungee cord that I need. Now, why I say the maximum is because this is going to stretch. And if it's going to stretch and hold this in place, 
my idea if you have it just a little snug to begin with when it does stretch it'll stretch in a way to where it's good and snug against the bottom of the hammock and since this is a rectangular under blanket or whoopee since it's an, an, a rectangular item it should fit the unusual asymmetrical design that the Hennessy hammock has. Now I have my cordage cut to length and on the corner, one, any one of the corners, I'm just going to go ahead and tie off a bit of this cordage so that way I'll hold it in place and then I'm going to go ahead and start loosen, uh, lacing the loose end through all of the eyelets all the way around the doobie. Now as I lace the bungee cord through the loops around the doobie, I'm going to go ahead and bring it back around on itself with a little bit of pucker and the doobie. Now see what I'm talking about here in just a second. See how that's just a little loose with the bungee being a little tighter and then I'm going to run that right back through the same eyelet and I'm going to do that all the way around. And the reason being is I am in theory thinking that this would bunch up on itself if I didn't take this type of a precaution. Now, <laughs> this can turn out horribly wrong. And uh, that's, that's going to be part of the fun, I guess, to see what works and what doesn't work. But the best thing about it is I already had this stuff. It's not going to cost me a dime. It's going to take, cost me a little time. And that's what I've got out here for uh, this weekend, is to spend the time experimenting with stuff like this. Now I have the entire doobie laced exactly how I explained. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a little bit of excess. I'm going to cut a little bit of this excess off. And then, just for a temporary thing, I'm going to connect it to the four corners of the Hennessy hammock and see how it works. Now as crude as it may appear, it is actually in position. And I actually think I'm going to need to take up more of the bungee to make it even a little more top because it's just a little loose but i haven't tried it out yet so you're going to see it for the first time as, as i see if it's going to work or not keep your fingers crossed okay i'm just pushing this out of the way with the elastic i'm opening the hammock Now I definitely feel the under quilt on the other side, but I'm actually seeing a lot of light coming through the side with the camera. That's also the side I entered. Now I'm going to see if I can get out the same way. Uh, it looked like the under quilt sort of bunched up over on this side. So, looks like I need to make that just a little more top or sew in a 550 cord loop right here so I can connect it up. I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the footage, see how bad it messed up, and I'm going to take a look at this and see what I can do to change it, make it a little bit better. This is a field expedient fix. Since there is already a rigid fixed uh, ridge line inside the hammock, it's going to stay taut as soon as I get in it. It's going to go taut again. What's going to happen is I 
tied a, a, another piece of bungee here, went over to the back side and tied it to the same location because this is the short end and there's a short end over here. Where I tied this one, I tied it over here. On this part, I tied it in the very center, took it over, basically making an X, and tied it in the very center there. Let's see if that makes a difference. See if that helps keep the um, under blanket where it's supposed to be. Now I can feel the um, bungee cord is, is a little more snug than it was. So it's a little more difficult to push it out of the way, but not impossible. And I don't see the light that I did before. And this is an ASIM hammock, so I can get it in position wherever I need. <coughs> it looks like the uh, under blanket is high on the side away from the camera. And I can still see light coming through the hammock here. I don't know if minor adjustments will be able to help with that or not. Now, the trick is going to be getting out. Okay, I see the whoopee. I'm going to get past the bungee cords. I think these are just a little too loose here. Build expedient fix here. Little slip knot there, and let's see if that'll do the trick. Tie another one here. Can't hurt. Just remember, folks, you're seeing it here first, live as it happens. Okay, let's try it again. I can definitely see the under quilt on the bottom is better. It still looks like there's nothing there. Well, let's see a little bit. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's a lot better. Wow. That definitely changes things a lot. It's very, very warm in here. Yep, get out. It's warm in there. Um, it looks awful. <laughs> I'll be perfectly honest with you. It looks absolutely awful. However, that definitely lets me know that this is feasible. That with some fine tuning, this could definitely be an under blanket for the Hennessy hammock, which is an elusive beast at best. Yep. I'm going to call this a successful experiment and I'm going to think about ways that I can make this just a little more refined. And I'm also going to get something to eat. It's been a long day. I have no idea if the lighting's good enough or not, but before I uh, 
break out my food and start to eat it. I just want to take you a walk around the camp so you can sort of see what it looks like. There's my gear tree and uh, the bungee cord that I used today. Here's the big camera. And I use my load cells as tree bags. They uh, hang on the trees very, very easily. Got a couple more over there. One's my food bag. It'll actually get strung on a tree when I'm finished eating. But this is the um, Hennessy hammock that I experimented with today. And uh, I did a couple more things. As you can see, it's a lot more taut than it was. And I got in and tried it out, and it looks like it's going to do okay. However, there's still a lot more room for improvement. And load cells on the tree. It's not pretty. <laughs> not pretty at all. And there is my bivy camp. All ready for me to try out. I think it looks pretty squared away. I can't wait to sleep in it. I haven't had a whole lot of comfortable sleeps on the ground. But anyway, that's camp. I'm going to go ahead and break out some chow and get something to eat. Just an interesting little tidbit. For those of you that do not use solid fuel tabs, this is the remains of an Esbit brand solid fuel tab after it has been extinguished. As it cools, it creates all these little crystals through there. Yeah. That just um, looks like all kinds of stuff you don't want in your lungs.
You know, this is another test, <laughs> another experiment. I've had a really hard time trying to film in uh, low light. And it's about 8.30 p.m. And the sun's getting ready to go down. And the woods already is, is quite dark. Uh, I noticed it on the last little bit of footage I, I filmed. And the lights I thought <laughs> were good. They were uh, shop lights that were LED. They were really inexpensive. They were rechargeable. And um, they, they created a wave, lines that would go up in the image. It, it just was very distracting. So I decided to try two cheap, as in like $10, uh, Energizer headlamps. I bought one for my daughter and she liked it real well. And my wife mentioned she would like one, so I ordered her one. And while I ordered it, I ordered two extra just for this particular experiment. And I guess we'll see how it goes. I'll check the footage here in just a minute. But if this works, this will be the least expensive, easiest way for me to get decent lighting um, <laughs> at a, a premium price. Right now I have, there's one right there and it's uh, wrapped around a log. I have another one over there and it's wrapped around my tripod. And theoretically, I could, you know, uh, put Velcro on them and wrap them around any tree. And there's always trees where I film. And um, that would be really nice because there's a lot of what goes on in my camp that's after dark. And it's more laid back times, uh, contemplation time. And I just think it would be a nice thing to add to the videos. <laughs> this is, this is crazy. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm on a movie set and all the lights. Um, this is going to be <laughs> some getting used to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do this again once the sun goes down. It's completely black and of course they'll be able to see me from space. <laughs> and, um, I, this, this might be a, a decent remedy to my problem and uh, <laughs> we will see. Um, the fire I've been showing you is an upside down fire. And the upside down fire burns very slow produces virtually no smoke and um, there's a little steam coming off of it earlier because it's, it's rained a lot here over the past week and everything is absolutely soaked and um, I got a couple pieces I was a little iffy on but uh, yeah it's, it's okay it's, it's a little steam um, the same size fire the same amount of wood if I were to use a traditional from the bottom up, uh, there would be a tremendous flame, there would be a tremendous amount of smoke, and it just would burn out so very quickly. I lit this quite a, quite a while ago, and it does burn very slowly. And um, the one thing I really like about it, if you do it at the beginning of the day, you have a tremendous bed of coals to be able to cook with, if you like to cook. Which, by the way, I was going to cook uh, today, and. Uh, so what the temperature is going to be and uh, had a couple really good menus But we're going to have to save that for a time to where it's a little more cool And it just um, I was getting stuff together uh, this morning. I was just like nope. Nope. Not gonna happen Not gonna happen. Nope. Nope. Not gonna do it and uh, as it is uh, the mountain house meal I made It tasted fine, but it's just hot it's just hot. I, I don't know how well you can see my face, but I, I just sweat just pouring down. And this is um, still probably another hour or two before I actually start feeling a decent temperature drop. And um, just too hot to cook. But the upside down fire, I absolutely love it. Uh, it's my go to fire. Usually, I don't cook over an open fire. Um, I do every once in a while. Uh, I plan on doing more of it. 
but as far as just having a campfire this is absolutely fantastic i had one fire once of course it was very large when you look at it, it looks sort of like a, a wooden pyramid but the way i constructed it was um, as strategic as i possibly could and after i looked at the very first layer um, i got up and had to use a restroom oh in the middle of the night and it was still going fairly strong and i got up again and it was just a bed of coals and it was absolutely fantastic i checked my watch and it had been burning for seven hours seven hours i didn't have to do anything to it for seven hours and it was a phenomenal bed of coals i went back to bed and the next morning i got up and i'd slept in a little bit it was daylight and i got up started moving a stick through the coals got a few coals to the center they were still hot still had embers and was able to start a fire and within the next two or three minutes it's just an absolutely phenomenal fire i <laughs> i'm gonna have to do a video on it just simply because it's it's a uh, for for the reason most people have a fire in their camps this is the perfect fire for that if you like to cook and you want to have awesome coals to cook with fantastic you just need to sort of get used to it practice with it and you will be able to determine with the wood you're using the size of fire you need to uh, light and sort of guesstimate when the uh, the coals are going to be to the point to where you can really cook with them and if you're already i mean good with the the rapid method uh, from the bottom up that's fine absolutely fine there's absolutely there there's no ultimates in this game uh, everyone has their favorite go-to everything and it works for them and it, it doesn't matter if it works for anyone else or not if it works for you that's the most important thing it's something about a campfire even with Hollywood lights shining on you <sighs> have you ever thought about times that you spent around the fire and, and the people that you spent with around the fire the times you've had the conversations you've had I've been been thinking a lot about that this evening and um, probably the finest times I've ever had sitting around the fire was with dear friends that I used to reenact with now when I reenacted I was with a company called Hobbs Company of His Majesty's Independent Company of Rangers and historically they were a rough and rowdy crowd and um, so were we that's that's that was who we were in reality and that's who we were in our personas so we went to an event we went exactly the way they would have if we had any shelter whatsoever it was probably just a piece of tarpaulin that we used as a lean-to a plow point and primarily to keep our equipment uh, dry we all had wool blankets and we slept on the ground and um, in the evenings we would get a fire going and usually uh, private Kovacs and uh, Solomon would sneak off and they would find the quartermaster's tent and they would come back with an oak keg of ale and we would enjoy that ale around our fire as we talked about battles we fought as we shared stories, laughed, enjoyed each other's companies. And we would sing 
we would sing. Oh, we would sing. We would sing and people would come to our camp, but they wouldn't come in our camp. They would sit around the perimeter of our camps. And they did that. And I found out this because I, I talked with some of them that I could see off in the distance the next day. They said that they didn't want to ruin it. It was like they were watching history on a television, real history, like they traveled through time. And I look back at it today and um, I sincerely felt like I was of that time period. Uh, Corporal Crum, he would um, play his fiddle. Solomon would play his penny whistle. I would play my bow Ron, and everyone sang. And I do mean everyone. And some people had their own songs. And only they would sing them. And if they weren't there for whatever reason, uh, the song just would not be sung. And uh, I really miss those times. I have a, a very special place in my heart for those times. And um, by name, those people were Adam Kovacs, Bill Johnson, Patrick Crum, Michelle Crum, uh, Norman Della Wydell, John and Margie Wysocki, um, Ron Francis. I think if I forget anyone. Well, I'm going to attempt to sing this, and this is for all of my dear friends that I've spent so many fires with and sang so many songs with. Uh, my camera has been giving me fits. This is about the twelfth time I've tried to do this. We'll see if it happens this time. Of all the money that e'er I've had, I've spent it in good company. And all the harm that e'er I've done, alas, it was to none but me. And all I've done for want of wit, to memory now I can't recall. So fill to me the parting glass, Good night and joy be to you all. So fill to me the parting glass and drink a health whate'er befalls. Then gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Of all the comrades that e'er I've had, they're sorry for my going away. And all the sweethearts that e'er I've had would beg me one more day to stay. But since it fell unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and I'll softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. So fill to me the parting glass and drink a health whate'er befall then gently rise and softly call good night and joy be to you all good night and joy 
be to you all. Good night and God bless. Well, good morning, folks. Oh, I can honestly say I've had worse night sleeps. Worst night sleeps. Worst, worst night sleep. It's, I don't know. Anyway, but not many. This was not pleasant. Oh. This is uh, very snug. I guess it's uh, not supposed to be real spacious, but a little more snug than I uh, actually cared for. Oh, well. It was um, very difficult to move around. It was too, way too warm to put anything on top of me. But the bugs are really bad. As a matter of fact, when I was setting this thing up, the bugs had gotten in, some, you know, quite a few of them. So I was uh, picking bugs off of me throughout the night, which I mean, you know. No problem. It just woke me up. That's all. And uh, my my hips and back and uh, knees. Uh, I'm just getting too old for this stuff, I guess. I I think this would be good for a winter bivy um, because the inside of it sort of rubbery and doesn't feel good against your skin and uh, a few things I noticed there was some condensation inside excuse me and um, I should have just went and rolled up that uh, little fly that's on the back to try to get a little more airflow because there's no point in having that thing down with uh, the tarp over top of it you know, I'm not going to give up on it. I'll, I'll, I'll try this this thing out a, a couple more times. Try to utilize a couple bits of information I gleaned from last night's sleep. But I didn't get in this thing until after midnight last night. Yeah. I knew it was not going to be worth my while because I knew this thing was going to be very warm. And I would love to see this same thing made with an inner uh, mesh cover that would have been absolutely fantastic last night we could have excuse me you could have two options oh i i literally just woke up i'm gonna go ahead and uh Turn this off and get some Joe going. And uh, I'll see you in a few. Well, I got the camp all picked up and uh, gone ahead and extinguished the fire. I'm on my second cup of Joe. And I'm eating a little Mountain House Southwest breakfast skillet. Uh huh. Well, I'm not 100% on if I'm keen on the bivy at this moment. If the temperatures were cooler, I would have been fine. Would have been just fine. But laying in the, the bivy with just the rubberized nylon laying on my skin... That was unpleasant. 
and um, it caused a little bit of perspiration and it got a little sticky and um, sticky and sweaty is not good for a night's sleep I had just I, I couldn't see it when I cleared the spot off I had just a little bit of a rise right where the small of my back is so normally I sleep on my back and uh, it just wasn't happening last night and from everything I've been doing during the course of the day yesterday my hips and knees uh, were quite sore so I, I'd toss and turn from one side to the other and it was warm it was warm I think at around 11 o'clock it was still like 68 degrees and that's just a little warmer than I like to be stuck in a body bag <laughs> it's funny <laughs> I was laying there, I'll close this back up. I was laying there last night and it was just unpleasant. And it reminded me of a time when I was in the Army and we were training at Fort uh, Irwin, California National Training Center. And when you're there, you're training as if you are in actual war uh, for about 30 days. And uh, so, I mean, it's, it's non-stop. Well, we were engaged into a tank battle, and I was a loader on a tank. I was down inside the tank where I'm supposed to be. And our whoopee light goes off, uh, signifying that we've become a simulated casualty. And all of us were given these things called casualty cards. They're in an envelope, sealed envelope, that we keep in our pockets. So that way, when you become a simulated casualty, when you get to the first aid station or wherever it is you're you're going usually a medic will come and they'll check it first but it will describe a very specific injury sometimes you're just dead you're just dead you blowed up and um so i was the one nominated to be the designated casualty so i got out of the, the tank Walked over to the observer's jeep, got in there. They uh, transported me over to uh, someone who's going to transport me to our field hospital. And we loaded up into the back of something called a gamma goat. And it's a really funky looking tractor kind of thing. And um, it has a trailer attached, so we loaded up on that. <laughs> Would never recommend riding one even in the front and we had to make a couple stops and things like that and so by the time that we finally got to the field hospital it was in the middle of the night and um, i think it was late morning when we got hit and so they took us out put us into triage and um, they looked at our cards and um, they took me straight into the operating room and sh shows the card to the doctor the doctors he's gone he's dead he bled out hours ago and um, so I was taken out and put back with the other casualties and all the the KIAs uh, were in this little holding facility and um, yeah it was cold it was very cold it, yeah it's a Mojave Desert but it was Mojave Desert in January and February so it was cold. I didn't have anything with me uh, except the, the BDUs I was wearing. So we were sort of like sitting close together. And then finally the sun came up. And we're like, oh, this is great. And um, so the sun came up. We're hungry. Uh, we're cold. And uh, we just want to know when we're going to get back with our, our units. And uh, at that point, uh, the doctor came out uh, with two or three other guys. And um, they had a box and they reached in the box they started throwing these rolls at us they said open those up and we rolled them open and they were body bags and they said get in those get in them and we were looking at each other you got to be kidding me said, get in them so we opened them up and we climbed in he said now zip them up and we're like ah oh, no no we ain't playing this no I'm not I'm not zipping this thing up and she he says he's like you have to realize that this is for real and had this been a real battle and you would have been a real casualty you'd been zipped up 
all your parts into one of these body bags. It's like, this is the reality of it. And we were very, very, very awakened and sobered by his comments because we were sort of joking around, laughing and stuff like that, just wanting to get back to our unit. But um, yeah, laying in a body bag. Wow, it's like laying in a coffin and someone reminding you that yeah, you're gonna be here someday. The crazy stuff you think of when you're camping, right? <laughs> well, folks, I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. I'm going to take one final look at uh, the different experiments that I did, the uh, different um, camps that I set up, and the Hennessy hammock underquilt. As ugly as it was, I do believe that it has great promise. It definitely needs to be streamlined to the point to where there's none of this unnecessary bagging and everything. However, with the last little uh, things that I did, I uh, secured it a lot higher over here and over here. That pulled that out and that definitely pulled everything up. And when I get back in it now, these do come back to where they need to be. Now, as I said, I need to refine and streamline this to where it actually looks like it's supposed to be there. And there's a couple different things I was thinking of. One of which, on the Whoobies and the Doobies and the Arctic Whoobies, there's 550 cord sewn on the edges. I very easily could sew 550 cord on the actual Hennessy hammock another loop to where I could run this loop through that loop and put a small toggle there just to hold it in place. I think that uh, the dimensions are just about dead on. And especially if I rig it to where I have the end corners on a uh, Prusik line on the main uh, hammock line, ties it to the tree. I think it I think it will be great. But once I get those modifications done, I'll set it up and I'll show you how it turns out. Let's take a look at the other camp. Now this was my camp that I had set up with the Snug Pack Stratosphere Bivy. I think for cooler weather, this is going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, the only issues that I had with it primarily is because it was very warm. When I take this to the secret fun spot, we're going to be in a rock shelter. It's going to be a lot cooler there. I'm going to be laying on sand, which is the floor of all of those rock shelters. So I don't think I'm going to have any comfort issues with any uneven uh, rises. Because if I do, I just move around a little bit and shake my little tushy. And I'll move that sand around to where it accommodates my body. Everything about it should be much cooler than it was here. And I'm also going to make certain that I do not extend that back fly that covers up the, the netting. I want to have full uh, ventilation up there as much as I possibly can. And I'm also going to think about some way that I can add something to the interior in order to lift it up off of my body. And... Um, it may not happen uh, when I, the first time I take it to the secret fun spot. As, um, as of right now, me and my buddy John Walsh, we're going to head out tomorrow uh, for an overnighter. And I think I'm going to go ahead and take this bivy to give it a try. But um, I think that would help tremendously not having that rubberized nylon touching your body. But as far as the first trial... I think that there are tremendous pluses to this, especially cold weather. Cold weather, definitely. This would be absolutely fantastic for a minimalist camp um, if you got a ground camp. And that's another thing. 
I just, I, I've hung in trees, sleeping in hammocks for so many years and it's so absolutely comfortable. I just, um, I find it difficult to go back to something that I never really have been comfortable doing. But as far as um, where I'm going, there's ground everywhere. There's ground everywhere. And uh, just about any place that I would choose to camp with this, it's going to have overhead cover and I don't have to worry about packing up the tarp. It'll lighten things up a good deal and um, it should work out very, very well. Well, folks, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.